Hey, we want to welcome you to Harvest Church here this morning. And I uh, want to invite you to grab yourself a seat as more people are coming in. And I'm going to direct your attention over to Psalm 29 here this morning as we begin. Psalm 29, where the Bible says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. And verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Well, this morning, you are in a place where you can hear God talk to your spirit. You can hear his voice. But everything all gets started when we come into his presence and we ascribe value and worth to him. So let's do that this morning, shall we? Lord, we ask you to bless this gathering together that we have today. We invite you to be a part of it. We invite you to speak to our hearts this morning. We invite you to be glorified here in our midst. It is all about you. Always has been, always will be. Be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Maybe you, you may stand if you wish, and let's worship the Lord. Amen. So this morning, we're just going to declare that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So if I say, God is good, you say all the time. If I say all the time, you say
good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship.
down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, desperate for you. I'm desperate for you And I surrender And drench my soul Is mercy and grace to me
I surrender I want to know you more I want to know you more I surrender and I surrender and I want to know you I want to know you more. I surrender, give it all. I surrender. to draw closer to you oh Jesus draw closer to you surrender and I surrender and I want to know you more I want to know you more I surrender and I surrender Jesus I want to know to know
have your way. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then the third at break of dawn the son of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the King shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face let's just sing that verse again you shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face.
Spirit of God has uh, brought to us this morning kind of something that he wants to really settle in our hearts, and that is to consecrate ourselves, yield ourselves in a fresh way for the future. You and I can't change our past. Only God can forgive our past, and he has. We're so grateful for that. But you stand at a crossroads this morning of your future. It might not feel like it. You might be in the midst of a storm. You could be in the midst of, uh, hey, you're not sure what's coming next. But nevertheless, you are at a crossroads. And I really believe that for many of us here, the Lord is saying, are you with me? Are you with the Lord? Are you with the Lord? So this is an opportunity to consecrate yourself. I want, I want to ask you and invite you to do that right now. Just between you and the Lord, are you with him? Are you with his plan for you? Are you with his future the way that he's pictured it for you? Why not join him right now? Why not just say, okay, Lord, I'm with you. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm with you. I'm walking into the future that you have for me here this morning. And I'm consecrating myself. You know, the Lord told Joshua to tell the nation of Israel before they went into the promised land, consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecration comes first. That's why it's so important. That's why I feel the Spirit of God is talking to us this morning about that. Are you in? Are you all in? Yes. Give you a moment. Give you a moment. Just as Dave and the worship band plays a moment. This is between you and the Lord. This is your offering, really. You're offering yourself to the Lord for His future. Whisper your response to the Lord. This is between you and the Lord. Just whisper your response to him this morning. This is important. This Heaven takes note. Heaven takes very, very good notes about the times that we place ourselves in his hands and say, I'm going forward with you, God. I'm going forward with you. Remember, it doesn't have to feel like anything. It can feel like your worst spiritual day in the whole year. It has nothing to do with your feelings. It has everything to do with heaven and heaven hearing your and my willingness to walk forward into the future with him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, Lord, we ask that these moments of consecration, these moments of uh, commitment of our hearts to you in the future, whatever comes. Lord, we know they're important. We know that we do business with you here today. So Lord, we ask you to seal these choices that we're making here this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's, uh, let's express our thanks to Dave and the worship band for leading us into the presence of the Lord this morning. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. You may be seated. You know, we're at the most wonderful time of the year, especially if you're a mom or dad. And so uh, you've started to see the yellow school buses out there. It's time for uh, back to school. Uh, As I say, sometimes parents will say the most wonderful time of the year. I won't sing it for you, but I'm going to ask all of our kids, all of our young people, all of our kids who are going to school. In fact, you might be actually... um, I want to include you in this if you're a university student or a Logos Bible College student. Uh, if you're going to be a student, and maybe, you, maybe you've already started, maybe you're starting this week, whatever, I want you to come on up. We're going to pray for you. We're going to ask that this would be the most remarkable year that you've ever had. That's right. And I'm going to invite uh, Derek and May, our children's pastors, to come on up and to lead us in a prayer. If you are going to be in school this year, I want you to come. All the kids, all the kids, even the little ones, if, if, if your little one is not uh, in school yet, you can catch something with this too. Come on. Come on. <laughs> all right. Okay, Derek. Well, as you know, uh, May and I both have the privilege of leading our, the children here. And actually, if uh, Richard, you guys... 
Richard and Natalie, 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 you guys want to come up too, and, and uh, Mr. Trevor, David, and uh, Ms. Cheryl, is anybody involved with the kids and the youth and our, our, you know, our college group? Um, we just want to bless you guys, and uh, we want to we want to consecrate them too uh, for this next year, and just just pray over them and, and just uh, just really prepare them them for the challenges that they'll be facing this coming year, and for God's protection. Amen. Amen. Wow, there's so many of you guys. It just makes me so happy to see every single one of you. What a beautiful crowd we have. Um, I just wanted to say I'm so thankful for each and every one of you, and that each and every one of you are so dearly loved by the Lord, by the Father God, and, um, you know, he has a special destiny and a purpose for each one of your lives, and um, we just want to pray into that, we just want to, as a community, support you and um, show you that we are behind you, we are cheering you guys on, you guys are going to finish the race, and you guys are going to do amazing, okay, so... Um, I guess the pastor's already up here, so if, if we could all just surround all our students, and um, I'm just going to pray a prayer of blessing over everyone, okay? <laughs> okay, Father, we ask that you would watch over each one and protect them so not one hair on their head is harmed. We speak every protection of Psalm 91 over each one. May you pour out your spirit of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, discernment, and revelation. May they grow in the knowledge and reverence of you, which is the beginning of all wisdom, according to Psalm 111, Proverbs 1, 4, and 9. May you bless them in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing found in Christ, according to Ephesians 1. May you cause each one to have a spirit of excellence so that they will be the head and not the tail, along with all the blessings of the covenant found in Deuteronomy 28. May you raise them up as a generation of Davids, Josephs, Daniels, Esthers, Deborahs, Marys, Pauls, Peters, along with all the godly men and women who put their faith in you, obeyed you, and did mighty exploits in your name. May you give them a heart to know you, to love you, to seek you all the days of their lives, living ever closer to you as each day goes by. And may you cause them to be successful in all that they do, to have favor with God and with man. And may there be within them a spirit of hope and victory at all times. May they be a light in the darkness, spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ wherever they go, and to whomever they encounter. And may we as a body and a community commit to nurturing, nurture them, love them, and bless them as they grow into the full measure of the stature of Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. And Lord, we bless all these teachers. We ask your anointing to flow upon these teachers, Lord. And also this Wednesday night, Father, as we start a new program for children called Freedom in Christ. Thank you, Father. Amen. And there goes the kids. Thank you, Pastor Richie. How's our uh, young people heading out? It's good, to, uh, it's good to see Diego and Mark uh, returning ORU students. Welcome back. All right. Cool. All righty. I'm going to invite Beth to come at this time and to uh, lead us into our offering as we honor the Lord with our resources. So yesterday, my husband and I spent our day on the ORU campus moving our son into the dorm, and that's an amazing place. It really is. Um, it's it, It's... I was thinking this morning when we were singing about the goodness of God, how the, when I was there, we would say, something good is going to happen to you today. And it really is happening on that campus. It really is. It's different from when I was there in the 80s. It's much better. It's become better and better. 
So anyway, we, while we were there, we had the opportunity to hear uh, ORU President Wilson speak a couple different times. And one of the things he talked about was decisions. And we've already had an opportunity this morning, right, more than one, to make a decision to go all in for Christ. And that was one of the things he was talking about. But he said, he has a statistics that said, we make 33,000 to 35,000 decisions a day. So some of them are small, some of them are big, you know. Um, and he also talked about choosing life and not choosing death. He talked about how we're in the valley of decision. And you remember in Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30, where um, God gives his people opportunities to choose to follow him and be blessed or choose not to follow him and be cursed. And so um, I, I also, he also told us that with, you make about 227 decisions a day about food, what we're going to eat. <laughs> probably. Some of us probably do make more. <laughs> Maybe some less. I don't know. <clears throat> so anyway, I, I look for some research on how many decisions we make each day concerning our money, but I couldn't find it. So I, I do wonder, though, how many decisions we make concerning finances, how we spend money, how we save money, how we give money, how we earn money. I mean, we, I, I probably spend quite a bit of time doing that, especially as an accountant thinking about the numbers. So, but the Bible includes instructions on decisions um, we make about our dollars, and it often tells us the outcome of our choice. So I'm just going to list a few of them. Matthew 6, 24 says you can't serve God and money. You have to choose one or the other, which one are you going to serve. Um, even, hopefully everybody chooses to serve God and uses money instead of letting money use them. Um, and right along that same thing, theme, Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Whoever loves money never has enough. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. So our, our satisfaction, our contentment comes from God and from serving him. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That's choosing to serve money instead of God. Um, Romans 13 8 says don't run up debts except for the huge debt of love that you owe each other wow. Proverbs oh, can you imagine what that'd be like to be in debt because you love people so much <clears throat> Proverbs eleven twenty four and 25 says be generous and gain even more withhold and come to poverty 2 Corinthians 9 7 says decide in your heart what to give and give with joy God loves a cheerful giver so today we have an opportunity to make a decision about what to give. Um, many of you already decided. You already know what you're giving today. You're making decisions about what you're giving tomorrow. Um, but if you haven't decided yet, just take a minute, ask Holy Spirit what he wants you to do. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come. We'll pray and we'll receive the offering. Father, we thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for what you're doing in our city, in Tulsa Metro, in ORU, Father, in all the schools that, we, that were represented here today. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you that we have the opportunity to make choices and decisions and that you help us make good choices and good decisions. And so, Father, as we bring our tithes and our offerings today to you, what we have decided to give, we ask that you would multiply it, that you would protect our families, that you would rebuke the devourer for our sakes. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the ushers have, you, you can give here in the, you can give here in the sanctuary with the ushers, and the, or you can give out in the lobby if you want to use a card, or you can text to give. Thank you, Beth. All right. Uh, while the offering is being received, I want to direct your attention uh, to the screens. Uh, we've got some announcements for you, some things that are uh, going to shortly come to pass right here at Harvest. Here it is. Good morning, Harvest Church, Broken Arrow.
Thank you, Aurora and the media team. Hey, we want to welcome our senior pastor, Pastor Richie Manganero. Let's give him a, yeah, give him a welcome. All right. I, Richie, that, that's, I don't think that cuts it. Come on. Come on, come on. John, you're nuts. I mean, don't come do on. That. Come on. There we go. You guys, you're too nice to me. Are you going to do that after the sermon? I don't know. Is there enough going on at Harvest Church? Did you see all those announcements? It's like it's crazy. It's just crazy, but a church has to be like a river, right? So it just keeps flowing. There's events like Saturday morning yesterday I was up here studying, and Jackie did a class on how to write a book. And there was like 20 people there. And then Caleb and Courtney are starting this Freedom in Christ thing Wednesday night. They have 11 kids to do Freedom in Christ for children. And Jamie and Jason are going to be helping out with that. And then how many people signed up for Freedom in Christ? How many adults? 39? 39 adults. Wow. Are they all from Harvest Church? No. Wow. So, Wow. I've been praying that the church would have an evangelistic tool. I don't know what that looks like, but I think this is part of that evangelistic tool to get people uh, an understanding of the foundation of Jesus Christ, their position in the Lord, who they are in Christ, all that great stuff. So, you know, once again, I just want to say thank you for Vic and Lois for pioneering freedom in Christ for many years and training these two guys. So we thank you, Frick and Lois. One of the greatest things a father can do is always wish or, or always believe that their children will go further on what they're doing. So that's what I have a, you know, on my heart for this church, my kids. Anyway, if you're new, if you're new here for the first time, hold on to your seats. Let's see what the Lord's going to do. So, you know, as a pastor, one of the, one of the most interesting things that, uh, that happens to me often is Anita will say to me, uh, Rich, what are you going to preach on? And uh, that was on Friday, and I said, I haven't gotten a clue what to preach on. <laughs> so then... You know, it, it's, it starts a, a series of, of, of thoughts within my heart of seeking the Lord and finding out, okay, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? Uh, I think it's a privilege to, uh, to speak God's word. I'm just one of many preachers here, though. We are gifted with so many people who can preach. Uh, so I like to open up the pulpit because if, if a church is built around one gifting, that's not good. It needs to be built around the body of Christ and the multiple giftings in the body of Christ and the multiple expressions. So that's why sometimes I'll have Scott and Julie preach or John Frill preach or Rich and Natalie preach or, you know, different ones, David and Hannah. Why? Because I'm, a, a church should be built around him and the different expressions through people. But I have the privilege of, of speaking today. But before I do that, uh, I'd just like to say a big welcome to Scott Reddall, who's the youngest son of, of Lee and Sharon Reddall. Uh, he was part of this church for many years, and then things happened. He got married, moved to Phoenix, and all that kind of stuff. So, but he's visiting. So, Scott, we welcome you to Harvest. And uh, it's like... Wow, Scott's back for a, 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 you know for a, a day here with us. Uh, anyway, thank you, thank you, Scott. Thank you for raising Lee and Sharon. Thank you, thank you. It takes a village, Scott. It takes a village. Okay, so I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and 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 I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And I heard the word cast, casting, cast. So. Uh, obviously, he's not casting me for a play. He's casting me for something 
much much bigger than that uh, and so when you so I, I just open up the you know a googled casting and casting in the strong concordance uh, and uh, it's great to have this type of technology and uh, I looked at the different aspects of when that word is used in the scripture and um, it's really it's really kind of interesting. One of the first uses of the word cast was not very good. It was in Genesis 37, 24, when Joseph, his brothers, got jealous of him, and the scripture says that he cast him and they cast him into a pit. So that wasn't good. Do you ever feel like you've been cast into a pit? Yeah, but that's okay because there's a remedy for that. There's an antidote for that because in Psalm 40 it says, uh, I waited patiently for the Lord and inclined unto me. He heard my cry and he drew me up from out of a pit of destruction. So no matter how far you might think you've gone down or have been cast down, and in this particular case it was betrayal and jealousy that his brothers got into and they threw him into the pit, you do remember the rest of the story when it, concerning Joseph because he went from the pit to the palace eventually. So I think that's a pretty good. Many times we start off one way, but we end up another way. And sometimes I might feel like I've been cast into a pit, but God has a way of reaching out, put me on a rock, because the scripture says in Psalm 40 that he reached out and climbed unto me, heard my cry, drew me up out of a pit of destruction, out of clay, set my feet upon the rock, made my steps sure, and he put a new song in my mouth, and they're singing praise unto our God, and many will see him fear and trust in God. You, your life's have an effect on people. And the way you act out there could have a major effect on bringing somebody into the kingdom. And man, when I, I, I was in that pit of destruction, I was in that marmory clay, I was in it, and God drew me out of it because I got born again, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. And before you know it, I was sitting upon a rock, I was standing upon a rock, and I was feeding from that rock of my salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, God. Help me, Lord. <laughs> Jesus, Mary, Joseph. <sighs> that's some, sometimes that comes out because I was raised Catholic. <laughs> this happens. Being new here for the first time, I was born in the Bronx, raised on Long Island, and I still have the Catholic accent. Uh, no, not the Catholic accent. I still have the, the New York accent. It's good to laugh. There's so much seriousness out there, isn't there? Just watch the news. You cry. It's good to come to church. You can laugh. Whew. Judges 6, 20, 28 says that Gideon had an encounter with the Lord. First thing he does, he obeys the Lord. And, the, and, and, and what the Lord tells Gideon to do is, he says to Gideon, cast down those, those, those idols that your dad built to Baal. So, you know, sometimes we have an experience and God wants us to go after the idols and go after those things that we need to surrender to him. Uh, read the story and if you get a chance, it's Judges chapter 6. It's really good. Uh, Gideon is afraid to do it, but he does it at night and gets the job done. And uh, I can relate to him. I mean... I wouldn't want to pull down, you know, stuff like that back then. But he says that he cast down his dad's altar to the Baal. You know, so we see there's, there's a casting down. Uh, uh, sometimes we get cast into situations. Uh, Exodus uh, 15.1 says, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider was cast into the sea. Some translations thrown. But... When it comes to casting, you know, Ecclesiastes 3, 5 says there's a time to cast away stones. And I believe that those are the, just the resentments and the disappointments and the unforgiveness. I need to cast those things aside. Uh, another aspect of the word cast is found in Luke six forty two. It says, cast the beam out of your own eye to help you see the speck that's in your brother's eye. So we find this word is like woven throughout the scripture. Jesus cast out the money changes in the temple. Ah, oh boy, that would have, must have been a quite a day. 
In Romans 13, 12, it says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast out or cast away the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Uh, so we, we see that uh, as I was, I was you know, studying these different words for casting, I said, well, okay, Lord, these are great scriptures. Uh, even David cried, why you cast down on my soul? So even our soul can get cast down. But I just know that uh, God wants to lift us up. God wants to sit our feet like hinds feet in high places. Uh, God wants us to be able to realize that we're seated in heavenly places with him positionally. Uh, God wants us to walk in uh, an uprightness, but walk in a standing with him that truly is amazing. But the, what, what got me was these particular scriptures found in the New Testament when it comes to the word casting. Found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. You guys are probably familiar with this, but this is what that means. Chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. Listen to this. It says, for the, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down arguments or imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into thought or into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now that is one loaded scripture or scriptures. So we see here, the first thing he says, that the weapons of your warfare, weapons. I think one of the greatest weapons against the enemy is prayer. I think the word of God is an amazing sword and is a weapon against the enemy. The logos and even the rhema word of God, the prophetic word. I believe faith is a weapon against the enemy. Man, the Holy Spirit is a major weapon against the enemy. So what it's saying here, you have weapons that you can use at your disposal when your mind is getting intact and when you're in a spiritual battle, you can call upon the Lord because he is mighty and it's not by might nor by power but by his spirit. He's mighty to pull down strongholds and cast down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Now follow me with this. And I really like the way Rick Renner put it in the Greek because he is great when it comes to Greek. Yeah. And he said this, concerning imaginations, concerning arguments, concerning everything that wants to exalt itself against the knowledge of God's word. He says this, we walk around throughout the day with rational thinking, and we also walk around throughout the day with irrational thinking. So, rational thinking. What's that? Well, that's the Greek word is logic when it comes to imaginations. Logic. Thinking that makes sense. sense. But you have to be careful with thinking that can make sense. Since many times, God doesn't make sense. Ponder that one for a while. So my rational thinking comes into being. When God calls me to do something, my mind will move in rational thinking logical thinking, and usually when God calls you into obedience and doing something, it really doesn't make sense. It did not make sense for me to have a dream from God to start a Bible school because I never started a Bible school in my late 60s. My logical thinking came into existence, and when I got that word of the Lord through that dream, I said to myself, I don't know how to start a Bible school. How's the baby? Three. 
Good. <laughs> I don't know how to start a Bible school. I don't know the first thing about how to start a Bible school. And I, my mind started to talk myself out of it. Your mind, with your logical thinking, will talk yourself out of big dreams that God wants to give you. Because usually he doesn't move with logic. He usually doesn't make sense. Like I remember when Anita and I were called to pastor a church in Long Island, before we left the pastor of that church, the Lord spoke to us and said, give $1,000 to the church you're going to to help them start a building fund. Logically, I started to talk myself out of it because I said, Lord, I'm not, part, I'm not going to be part of that church anymore. I'm going to be part of a different church in Long Island. See how logical it didn't make sense? But I gave it anyway because God sometimes doesn't move in logical thinking. Was it logical to use five loaves and two fishes? Was it logical to turn the water into wine? Was it logical to make spit and put it on a blind man's eyes? Was it logical? No, it wasn't. God wants to sometimes get us out of our comfort zone and make us do things that we never dreamed we were able to do. That's why when it comes to pass, we can say, I got to give all glory to God because it wasn't me that did it. I could have never have fulfilled this. You want to be in on a secret? On your pastor's life. You want me to tell you a secret? Okay. How my, my mind, logical mind is thinking. Logically, I don't want to have Harvest Church go to two services. Logically, because I like community and family, and I think, how is that? How, how do we keep community and family logically? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm just telling you how I'm thinking. <laughs> so uh, if anybody has any advice for me... It's, what does somebody say that build a bigger church? Build a bigger church. Because, see, logically, when you hit the 80% mark, people walk in and they say, there's no place for me here. Oh, man, that is statistically. But, see, logically, God's logic or man's wisdom is what? Foolishness to God? I'm just being honest with you. And I said to the Lord, whatever your will is. You know, we sang that song, I surrender, I surrender. What, who do you think, what do you think I'm surrendering? You. <laughs> this church, the will of God for Harvest Church. <sighs> now, then you have illogical thinking. Illogical thinking is usually many times in the realm of fear and worry. You think something's going to happen to you. It's illogical. It doesn't. And that can trap you. It really can. I remember, I, I remember this story a while back. Oh, I don't know. I was probably in my 30s. And all of a sudden, I, was, I, was, uh, I got out of the shower, dry myself off, and I, I was drying my knee off, and there was a big lump there. So my irrational thinking kicked in. And I said to myself, because fear started to take over, oh my God, I got cancer. I went from a lump to cancer in, 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 in 60 seconds. See, that's irrational thinking. So I went to the doctor and got checked out, and it was a, it was a cyst. See how we jump? So when Paul here is speaking to the Corinthians, he's saying, hey, guys, you need to cast down these imaginations and arguments, whether they're irrational or rational, and every high thing that will exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, 
every thought that I think throughout the day? No, it's not talking that way. It's talking the thoughts that when you're in a battle and you're thinking rationally or, or irrational. Now, if you're so spiritual that you can take every thought and bring it into captivity, go for it. I don't do it, especially my thoughts about food. <laughs> but the, 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 the thoughts that are against the knowledge of God, yeah, I'm going to go after those thoughts, especially if they're not lining up with the, the will of God in my life, how I should go about what I should be doing. I got a word this morning from one of the intercessors saying, the Lord is blessed with your obedience. She has no idea what, how that lifted me up. So, we got to cast them down. The natural mind will come up with all kinds of thoughts to talk you out of obeying God. And I say we cast it down. Irrational strongholds, fears, worry, illness, um, or, the I, or the I will nevers. I'll never find somebody that's going to marry me. I'll never find a job that's going to provide for my family. I'll never get a raise. I will never, 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 never. Man, those are irrational strongholds. No, that goes contrary to the word of God. He's my provider. He's my shepherd. He's the one that will lead me and guide me. He's the one that can take control. He's the mighty one that can make me run through a troop and leap over a wall for Pete's sakes. I cry out to the Lord and he hears my cry when I'm in a pit. And boy, he brings me up and sets my feet upon the rock again. Uh, I kind of do it daily sometimes or at least weekly because I get attacked over and over again against the things that are contrary to the word of God in my life and walking in obedience to his will. But God is faithful and he can do all things. And I know that when he starts to work in me, he will finish it. And I will run through a troop and I will get that prize of that high calling of Jesus Christ and I'll take the people of God with me as we follow him. Hallelujah. Oh, God, help me, Lord. Sometimes you see my frustration, and you see my impatience, and you see what you want to do within me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Bring every thought into captivity, Father, because, uh, Lord, uh, there's no time to mess around. In the, in, in, <laughs> there is just not time to mess around. Hallelujah. You want, to, you want to watch irrational thinking? Put on the news. It's crazy out there. So then this, the second thing was in 1 Peter 5, the other scripture that really I felt like he was just doing something with me with this scripture. 1 Peter 5, listen to this. It says... Uh, God resists the proud, in verse 5, verse 5, 1 Peter 5, but gives grace to the humble. Look what precedes the next scripture. That one says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Here's that word mighty. That we may exalt, you may exalt him in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Is that word Casting. But first, before you're going to do that, you've got to humble yourself. And I think humbling myself is me getting on my knees sometimes and saying, I am weak, Lord, but I know that my, your strength is made perfect in my weakness. I hum myself, help! And it's not like the Beatles song, help, I need somebody, help. Not just anybody, Help! I literally sometimes will walk around this church on a Saturday morning crying out to all three departments. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jesus, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. Father, I need you. Uh, can I talk to all three of you at once? Of course you can, Rich. Anything specific you want to hear from one of us? I need the Father's love. Pour it upon me. 
Jesus, I need you to be closer than a brother and a friend. Pour it upon me. Holy Spirit, I need you to do a mighty work within me. I'm struggling with sin. I'm struggling with a weight. I'm struggling with the Holy Spirit. Come upon me. I need you. Sometimes I pray that for Duke. Just kidding. <laughs> Casting. The word for casting in that particular scripture is really interesting. There is no ice cream in this bronze bag. You know what's in this bronze bag? Problems, bad habits, sickness, sins, church, betrayal, disappointment, rejection, unforgiveness, friends, burden, family. All these can be something that you can cast on the Lord. I, didn't, I, I think that you can cast a lot more. But you know what the scripture means there of casting? It means to casting, to fling with force, to greatly fling it, to do or to hurl something. So when you're casting your care upon him and say it's family or finances or unforgiveness or, or whatever, I got to fling with force this on God. God, this is my prayer right now. It's the church, Lord. It's the church. I don't know what to do. It's, got, it's a burden. It's weighing upon me. Help, help, help. So I cast it on the Lord. Let's see, who was bad this week? <laughs> you cast it on God. No, it means to fling this thing. To fling it on the Lord. No, I'm flinging that thing. I don't want it anymore. It has to go. I'm not going to be in trouble anymore. I'm not going to worry about finances. I'm not going to worry about this church, Father. I'm going to cast it upon you. And Lord, I'm not going to worry about the future. I'm not going to worry if we go to two services. I'm not going to worry how we're going to do this, Lord. I'm going to cast it up on Chuck. He can figure it out. Or Dave. Or whatever. God, take it, Lord. Take it, Father. I'm just going to cast it on you, Lord. Hallelujah. You see what it means there? We take the kingdom by force. We tell the enemy where to go. We use the sword of the spirit. We pull down those imaginations and we walk in freedom because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I hope I didn't upset the baby back there. <laughs> this doesn't happen every service. I do want the frisbee back. I probably, I pray frisbee with... Uh, my son and David, others, I win all the time. <laughs> it's amazing. You know what's a hard one to cast? Usually th this one to cast onto the Lord is a hard one. I I'll get it. It's in a closet. Just having a sandwich, you know, just kidding. <laughs> this is a hard one, Vic. Why? Why, Lord? Why did that happen? Why did this why did this thing happen? Why 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 this sickness happen, Lord? Why this disappointment happen? Why this rejection happened, Lord? Why didn't the things work out the way I thought they would? It's the why one. Now, when we were getting new letters, they, for some reason, they made an extra why. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was just for this sermon. 
Why? I was praying about something that really hit me this week, and my, my question before the Lord was, why? And uh, it was, my heart was broken. I was crying. Why, Lord? Why'd this happen? And uh, I just had to come to the place of, I surrender my whys to you. I forgive you, Lord, because you could have prevented it, but Lord, your ways are perfect, but what do I do with this disappointment within my heart towards God and thinking that he could have done something differently? So I, I move in forgiveness. We usually forgive in three areas, ourselves, God, and somebody else. In, in a perspective, people, have, people can forgive others easily. Then it's, they usually can forgive God, but many times people have a hard time forgiving themselves. Yeah. I, I tell people, God, the Lord's not going to go back to the cross and do it all over again. The price he paid was for yourself, too. But the whys, it's rough. And boy, but, but when I surrender that and humble myself, I don't understand. I know that when I get to heaven, I will have all those mysteries and those whys probably answered. But until that time, I'm going to trust you. Even, even Job said, you know, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So why do I have a prodigal that it hasn't come home to the Lord yet? Or why do I always have reoccurring problems in finances, say? Oh, fill in the blank. But you can't keep the whys in the closet because they're going to affect your relationships and your walk with the Lord. You've got to take them out of the closet, guys. Bring the whys out of the closet. And God is so merciful and so kind and so loving that when we question his will, we, we have the wise. He is there with his comfort and his grace to help us. And the scripture says this. It says that he cares for you. So any affliction, any difficulty, any hardship, any misfortune, any trouble, any complicated circumstances... To throw them on the shoulder of God. After all, the government is upon his shoulder. I think he can handle some of the whys or the burdens that I carry. And it says this, he cares for you, which means he's concerned, he's interested, he's aware, he notices, and he gives meticulous attention to you. So when I get to that place where I am humbling myself, and I get before him, I'm casting those cares, I'm flinging them on him. And then I get to feel his comfort, his grace, his wisdom. I journal with him on some of these questions. And there he is right there, a very present help in any time of trouble. You guys scared? So what do you think? You want to cast some cares upon him? You want to fling him at him? You want to say, Lord, I want to help. I want help casting down those imaginations and those arguments and that irrational thinking, rational thinking. I want those thoughts into captivity, Lord. I don't want them anymore. I'm going to cast my cares upon you for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. On with this. I'm lying. I'm not going to end. <laughs> you can't believe that when a preacher says that. <laughs> but really, I will end with this. It was back in around 19, in between 1985 to around 19. 
1990, in that time frame, Anita and I were pastoring a church in Long Island. Oh, I was under uh, a lot of stress. I was working a full-time job, pastoring the church, and uh, it was a time period where uh, we were asked to leave the location we were at, and I just remember... Uh, I had so many stress-filled nights, what happened with the church. And you know how the Lord sometimes will just basically let you go in the sense of, okay, Rich, you want to try to handle this on your own? Go for it. I'll be there when you fall apart. Because sometimes you've got to exhaust your own strength in order to walk in his. And uh, so I was under a lot of stress. I wasn't sleeping good. And, uh, and my thoughts were just irrational thinking thoughts. And I wasn't pulling down on a vain imagination. That, that I wasn't casting it down. And there was a prophet that came through to minister to the church. And we were in a relationship with him. His name was C.L. Moore. He was quite a prophet of God. And uh, he's prophesying over the people that were there. And then he, he kind of gets to me. And, uh, you know, I, I really thought I was going to get like, oh, you're just a great pastor type word, you know. No. It was, call it. Don't you know the stress will kill you? And the Lord's saying, you call it right now what you're a stress. And it was a rebuke in front of everybody. And after I got that word, you know what I was doing? You want to know what I was doing? You want to know what I did? I'll tell you what I did. I made a list of all the things that were stressing me. And I didn't even know the revelation of that scripture would have meant to cast your cares upon him. But boy, me and God got together because he just nailed me in front of the congregation. And I started to chuck every stress, no pun intended, chuck every stress (laughs) at him. It went. It was going. It was going. And I walked then in the peace of God with surpasses own understanding. And when you think about it, he can figure it all out because I don't have the shoulders to handle stress. 80% of illnesses are stress-related for peace sakes. And we should be a people that walk stress-free, anxiety-free, fear-free, and joyful. Wow. I can't give you an exemption to get out of jail free card to say you're not going to have tribulation in this world. You're not going to have a heartache. You're not going to have betrayal. You're not going to have rejection. You're not going to have hard times. You're not going to have persecution. I can't give you a get out of jail free card, but I can give you advice. Make an appointment. And the advice I'm giving you today is bring down those imaginations. If you feel like you're in a pit, don't worry. God can pull you up out of it. And you can cast your cares upon him. And no matter what time of the day it is, no matter when it is, God will be there right there because he's a very present help in the time of trouble. And if I walk before his throne of grace and I'm humbling myself, I know that the Lord will hear my cry. And though the circumstances might not change, my heart will change. And I'll still walk with the peace of God no matter what's going on around me. Thank you, Father. That was a great sermon. I can't believe it. It's a great sermon. <laughs> Just teasing. It's all him. I want the frisbees back. I do. And uh, <laughs> does anybody want the Y? No, let's see. Should I put the Y back in the closet? Okay. Why is going back into the closet? 
till we just preach this sermon next year when you all forget. And I'll bring the Y back. Tim, don't you take that Y. Just cleaning up. So what do you think, guys? You ready to surrender your stress, your rational way of thinking, any burdens that you might be carrying? Are you ready to surrender it? Let's all stand. Thank you, Father. Lord, it's a miracle. It's 1126, Lord. <laughs> Father God, you knew that how this sermon was going to go. You knew how the worship was going to go. You knew everything about the service, Father. Father God, I just pray, Lord, that we would each walk before your throne of grace together. Thank you, Lord. And if you can just repeat after me to say, Lord, I make a decision today to walk before your throne of grace, to ask for help in the time of need. I acknowledge I can't do it on my own. I need your help. I need your answers. I need your strength. I need the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Father, I give you my concerns. I give you my troubles. I give you my burdens. I give you the weights. I give you all the cares. I cast them upon you. I let them go with force. <laughs> and Lord, I receive your strength, your wisdom, your comfort, your guidance, your love, your peace, your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, have a wonderful day. Wow. If anybody wants prayer, come up for prayer. The prayer team's here. We end a little bit early. Go visit somebody that maybe is new here and just welcome them to Harvest Church. Thank you, Lord. Have a great day.